I've got some breaking news for you tonight. I've been speaking with sources and can now report a key attorney has left Donald Trump's legal team. That lawyer happens to be a major witness in the classified documents case against him. The reason Evan Corcoran became a key witness and appears as Trump attorney won all over that Florida indictment in federal court related to the documents is that Trump misled him, allegedly, in the indictment. Corcoran was compelled, he was forced by the Justice Department and the court to share what he knew and the notes he had kept of his interactions with Trump while the FBI and the Justice Department were seeking those records. He had gone into Trump's storage unit at Mar-a-Lago in June of 2022 to collect everything that was there and to turn it back over to investigators. And now he's geared up to be a key witness at a trial against Donald Trump. Oh, that's gonna hurt! When key attorneys are abandoning ship, you know times are about to get tough for the man his cult followers once called Teflon Don. The attorney at issue is Evan Corcoran. He was compelled to testify in Florida as part of the investigation into the sensitive classified documents that Trump kept despite repeated attempts from the federal government to return those documents to them. Now, the interesting thing about him is that he was a serious lawyer. Unlike some of his other lawyers, like Rudy Giuliani, you know, who was willing to do anything for him and have faced really serious repercussions as a result of it, this attorney took meticulous notes at the time of when Trump was telling him to do certain things. So he went, after receiving the subpoena from the federal government to return the classified documents, he went searching for them and he found a whole stash of them. But evidently, Trump told him to pluck out some of the bad ones. Now, he not only heard that, but he wrote that down. That kind of evidence, notes that you write contemporaneously in the moment, happens to be very credible evidence that gets introduced at trial. So as a result, he became a witness in this investigation that ultimately led to the indictments that we're seeing in his Florida case. He was compelled to testify, did not do it voluntarily, but these notes ended up becoming key. Now, the interesting thing, because you could think, wow, he was actually being fairly ethical about this, which he was, the fact that he actually took notes and was apparently disturbed about what happened, was that at the end of the investigation of him pulling out the documents and turning it over to the federal government, there was a certificate of compliance to be signed saying that we've received your subpoena, we've done everything that you've asked, and we are certifying that it is complete. But instead of him doing that, because I'm sure after hearing Trump's direction that it was to pluck the documents, he didn't quite trust that maybe he was getting all of the documents. He asked another attorney to sign it, Christina Bob, and she said that it was complete. As we know now, it certainly wasn't complete, which made her signing it sticky for her. And it's very possible that he may end up facing repercussions in terms of his law license because it seems like he knowingly asked somebody else to sign something that he knew probably wasn't true. So in addition to maybe his own personal ramifications, we know that now Trump is having serious ramifications because he was a, one of his more serious attorneys and he was still on the case in the January 6th DC trial, despite the fact that he had been a witness in the Florida trial. He was continuing his representation for Trump up until recently. So Trump is losing one of his more serious attorneys on that January 6th case, which is a crucial case for him. So on Monday, perhaps the most important part of the election interference trial regarding the hush money payments is jury selection. A whole trial can be won or lost based on how well you select your jurors. So it's a very important part of the case. Too bad that there's not cameras in the courtroom, unlike the Georgia case, so we all could see this. But just to give you a preview of what will happen, Happen because the judge has already said to the two attorneys, this is what's going to happen. First of all, they're going to be bringing in a huge pool of jurors, quite a lot. The more high profile a case, the more jurors they will bring in because they know they're going to have to excuse a lot of the jurors because of the fact that they're going to have strong opinions on it. So they're going to have a lot of jurors come in and what they'll initially do is have these jury questionnaire, like just on a piece of paper and get some really basic information about them and try to kind of weed people out that way. 
way. After that, when they start to ask the jurors individual questions, what the judge will do first will explain a little bit about the case. He'll talk about the charges against Trump, what kind of sentencing this is going to be, how long the trial will be, giving them a little bit of a preview of what kind of case they're going to be sitting on. This is typical for every juror case. The judge will give this type of summary. Then after that, he's going to ask the jurors whether or not they can have an honest, legitimate, and good faith reason to believe that they cannot serve on the case or that they cannot be fair and impartial. That is the question the judge will ask them. And if they feel like they cannot, they're going to have to tell the judge why. And work or school or childcare responsibilities alone is not enough because frankly, everybody would be able to get excused from a jury just for those reasons because everybody has work, school, or childcare responsibilities. Responsibility. So you have to have maybe you own your own business and you um, you know, being out for a certain number of weeks would like bankrupt your business or have severe financial repercussions. You have to have that kind of reason to be able to be excused for that. Now, it's really important to note here that of course, everybody has heard about this trial. The pretrial publicity is huge. A juror hearing the news is not enough to get a juror excused. Um, and we actually, you know, we just saw OJ Simpson passing away and his trial was at the time the most publicized trial ever. And there was cameras in the courtroom and everybody saw it and he was acquitted. And because of his acquittal, we now continue to have a lot of cameras in the courtroom. And we don't see that as a bad thing because yes, the defendant has a constitutional right to a fair trial. But despite all of his publicity, he was able to get a fair trial, right? He was acquitted. So that set the standard for the fact that we don't see publicity as being necessarily a bad things for defendants. And the jury selection is where any harm that may be caused to the defendant by publicity is supposed to be weeded out. So they're going to be asking the jurors, not just did they hear about this case, although they will be asking that, but they'll be saying whether or not you can set aside an opinion you may have formed as a result of the publicity. So you will have a juror say, I heard about this and maybe I even have a certain way of thinking about it, but I am willing to set aside that opinion and make my decision based on the facts as presented in this trial. And if a juror can do that, they can be seated. It's only if they say, that they have seen all the pretrial publicity and have made such a strong opinion about it that they cannot set aside that opinion. And in that case, they would be excused. And that's how they handle whether or not the publicity is prejudicial to a defendant. Not that they haven't ever seen it because that would be impossible in most high profile cases, including this, but can they set aside an opinion that they may have already formed? Now it's interesting in this case, because this case, there's going to be an anonymous juror and both sides have agreed to this. But what it means to have an anonymous jury is not that it is anonymous to the parties in the case. It is that it is anonymous to the public which means that both the prosecution and the defense know the names of the jurors. They know the addresses of the jurors. And the reason why that's important is because they will be checking on those jurors. They will be looking into their social media. So let's say a juror on the stand, when they go to ask them questions, say, I have no opinion about this case. I've never been involved in politics. And then on their social media, you see uh, Trump is guilty, 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 or Trump is innocent, innocent, innocent. This is all, you know, a witch hunt. Then the lawyer will present that as, you know, showing that that's not actually true, right? That the juror does have this. And this is typically done not just in a case, high profile case like this, but in every case, the lawyers will look at their social media. They will often hire, um, people to help them assist in kind of vetting those jurors. And the reason why the residences are so important is because depending on where you live, you can sometimes glean what your perspective might be on certain issues. So Trump's attorneys might like somebody whose residence is on the 
Upper East Side in New York because they may be more likely to be conservative, let's say, than in a different address. And so they may be more likely to want to have that juror. So these are the kind of things that the lawyers are going to be doing in this case as they do in pretty much any case. They try to find out as much as they can about the jurors in order to inform their opinion about which jurors to select and which jurors not to select. They cannot just have an unlimited amount of excuses, right? Now, there are certain things that both sides can excuse jurors for cause and that there is not a limit on the number. So if a juror has such a fixed opinion on a case, then they can be removed for cause. And that doesn't count of count against the number of jurors each side can be excused. And what we will see, although unfortunately we'll have to hear about it and not see in person, because again, there's no cameras in the courtroom, but sometimes what you'll see is you'll see a juror and let's say they'll talk about the fact that they've been, you know, a political protest before and they will say that they, went on marches, um, let's say for different events, but that this doesn't make them necessarily um, a Biden supporter or a Trump supporter. Let's say these marches were more about the climate, right? And so there's a little bit of ambiguity about how impartial this juror can be. And you will see both sides try to argue to the judge whether or not that juror should be removed for cause. Because one side will want that juror to be removed for cause because it doesn't count against their other chances to remove jurors and the other side will argue it against cause. And so there will be some very clear excuses for cause and then there will be some that are argued both sides to try to have the judge remove the juror from cause because the other ways of removing the jurors is this preemptory strikes and that each side only has a limited number so you may end up with a juror that you didn't really want on the jury but they were better than somebody you just removed because that was your last removal. And that's a little bit of the game both sides play. And that's why both sides often have jury consultants to help inform them of which type of juror would be more likely to vote in their favor because you have issues here. Yes, we have politics here, but we also have issues of being a business man. And what does that look like? Infidelity, how do you feel about that? Do you have a family member has been to jail, has been convicted of a crime? What do you think about the government in general? All of those types of questions, because those are the issues that are going to be presented at trial, in addition to the very obvious political questions about what you may see in the role of a candidate and how you feel about our elections and fairness around our democracy, all of those kind of questions they're going to be asking. And so the each side is trying to get like the best version of a juror that they can, but they often end up with maybe not exactly the jury they want, which ultimately you may say is fair, right? Both sides maybe have to do a little bit of compromise. Maybe that's actually what makes our justice system so great. So at the end of the day, there's 12 people who neither side were extremely happy about, but both sides were able to remove the people they were most worried about. Now, if uh, you are a good attorney, the other thing you're going to be doing in this process is connecting to the jurors because the individual attorneys for both the prosecution and the defense are going to be the ones asking the questions to the jurors. And there's an art to this. And if you are good at it, you may get those jurors chuckling and laughing and you are creating a rapport because at no other time in this trial will you be able to have such an informal chance to engage in the jury. In fact, opening and closing, you're looking at the jury, but otherwise, for the most part, you're looking at the witnesses on the stand and asking them questions. But this is a chance to maybe show your personality in a way to make you more likable because the more likable you are to the jury, then it's possible that might transfer to how much they like your client, whether or not that be the government or that be the defense. So a really good lawyer in this will not only be trying to seat the best jury they can, but they will be trying to also connect to the jurors to establish a relationship, to establish a credibility. So that way when they go and they start asking a witness questions, that jury will feel as if they maybe are more 
believing that attorney and that questioning because of that earlier report. So those are all sorts of things we get to look for in this jury selection that's gonna be starting on Monday. Real quick, Meta just changed their algorithm to suppress political content. Please follow our Instagram at Midas Touch right now as we head towards 400,000 followers so you don't miss a beat.